thank you again for coming, Kimberly. It's like amazing to have you. Because and everyone get ready because you're gonna learn a lot of amazing things today. I also want to tell you a little bit about what our virtual cafes are. So we are like organization and we want to create like thriving communities with opportunities to all. And together, like all of us, but especially our founder, Mr. F, we have around 40 years of experience with like uh, assets building, strategies, training, and learning. So we wanted to bring it together to the community. And the virtual cafes are kind of part of that. So we want to bring the call on this knowledge and opportunity to community so they can also learn with us. So we also we believe like by working together or sharing the knowledge we have between each other, we can make everything better and also turn the inaction into action. And our virtual cafes, they happen every Wednesday at 6 p.m. And each week there is like a different topic. So we have like youth development, then there is like community engagement, community development. There is a, a technology and innovation, which is us now. It fits perfectly. And then the like last one, but the least one, of course, is like economic development, jobs and careers. So that will be next week. And so it's like pretty amazing to have you, especially for the innovation and technology. And I want to say something about S3, but I kind of need a visual aid for that because it is kind of hard, but Kimber will explain everything to us. So S3 is the biggest international geographic information system or GSI software and geodatabase management. So it's a lot of big words, but we are going to find out very soon what those are. And but the best part is also they are local, especially to us in the Coachella Valley and San Bernardino, because they are situated, like the main headquarters is situated in Redlands. So that's basically kind of our neighbors. And as she mentioned, it's like companies, it's kind of it's everywhere, but no one really knows about it. And also I want to give a word to Jilska, uh, if you could introduce our guest. Tell us like a little bit of your history. Yes. Welcome, Kimberly. Thank you, as always, for accepting this invitation to take part in this cafe today. Um, Kimberly was one of the best things that happened to me in 2019. I was at my last public event and opened my mouth and got the door prize. And not knowing how to, use, <laughs> how to use the software or what, what it was all about. But very fast, I was able to join and also introduce uh, Esri to other geo thinkers in not only in this uh, in the Kuchala Valley, but to the rest of the world uh, through the work I do in the other parts too. Uh, so thank you, Kimberly, for being such an awesome uh, and awesome um, a thinker, geo spider thinker, and jumping in and working with us to make a better uh, world for everybody. Absolutely. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. So thank you, Jill Scott. So if you have any questions, uh, let us know in the chat. There will also, of course, will be time later. And Kimber has created an amazing presentation for us. Because we thought it's hard to explain visuals without visuals. So, so we have like a lot of new cool things to look at. So thank you. All right. I'm going to share my screen. And... Just let me know when you can see it. Hmm. Did it work? No. Okay. Let me hmm. go back. Oh, because I have to hit the button that says share. Oh. Oh yeah. Good. Now it works. Yes. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Perfect. Okay. So uh, like they said, I'm Kimberly Few. I'm um, a commercial health practice lead for Esri and we have, I've been there for six years. Uh, prior to that, I worked in law enforcement technology and emergency management. And I've lived in the Coachella Valley for about 28 years. So I'm local, I'm based in La Quinta. And uh, for my first three and a half years at Esri, I drove there every day to Redlands. I hope never to do that again. I'm remote now. Um, and will continue to be so. So I get to work from home, which is pretty great. But today, I just want to give you an overview of who we are and what we do and why we do it. So if you have any questions, interrupt me verbally. I can't see you now because I can only see my presentation on my screen. Um, but certainly ask any questions or afterwards, we'll have time too. Uh, so I, I told Jessica earlier, 
we joke that we're the largest company that no one's ever heard of before. Um, we are huge. We have 100 offices around the world. We're in 60, actually, it's 73 countries now. We've expanded since the slide was done. Uh, we have people from every walk of life that speak every language. And we say that we speak the universal language of maps because maps help translate data from every segment of the world. And we like to call it the science of where. So we use our software and we help people answer those fundamental questions like, where is it? How do I get there? Where's the problem? Why is it changing? You know, where should we relocate or where should we build? And at the bottom of all those questions is always, and why do I care? And, and so you can present problems to people, but if you don't make them care, they don't get solved. And so that's something that we are continuously asking, not just our customers, but ourselves. Are you presenting the data? Are you giving it to people in a way that they can understand? And are you helping them care? So we call it a GIS, a geographic information system. And fundamentally, it's maps at the base, but we take data and we layer it. And so we take that map as the center of everything that we do. And we bring in data, remote sensing data, BIM, which is buildings, uh, real-time data. So I have hospitals that are measuring uh, their assets. They're tracking their assets um, throughout the hospital. So they always know where a crash cart is, or they always know where certain things are. And now the nurses don't hoard them anymore because they can always find them. We track people. We track airplanes. I have um, AMR, our local ambulance company, uses drones out in the field to monitor wildfires. And they use our system to map those uh, pathways out. We do deep analytics, big data, lots of monitoring reporting, and always at the end of everything is customer engagement for our cities um, to involve themselves with their constituents, with our businesses, to be able to speak to customers and help them understand. So we like to think we're the center of everything. Maybe not everybody thinks that, but we like to. Um, and the numbers are pretty impressive. So the top companies in the world all use us. Every single U.S. state, all of the populous cities, the big cities all use us. Uh, almost every county in the United States uses us. Every water company, every electric company. Um, there's not a lot that we've missed. I actually run one of our smallest segments in healthcare um, that is growing rapidly. And in fact, COVID really progressed us quite a bit as far as um, being visual to people and helping them understand how hospitals and health systems would use maps. Um, but it's really good. We spend 30% of our revenue on research and development. Apple spends 5%. We spend 30. And Google, Apple, they're all in the same like 5 to 7%. Um, we're owned by a couple, a man and a wife, that grew up in Redlands, went back to Redlands, based the company there, and they've got more money than they'll ever need. So they like to give a lot of it away. They recently made a big purchase of the cent in the central coastal area of California and donated it to the Nature Conservancy uh, for research. So uh, to stop development and help with the research. But we also house the Living Atlas of the World, which is the largest collection of geospatial information in the world. And it gets more than 1 billion views every single day. So a lot of stuff going on behind the scenes. And for our local people, the numbers you won't see published a whole lot, they do refer to us as the Google of the Inland Empire. We have a 41 acre campus in Redlands with 28 buildings on it. Uh, we have our own Starbucks and a cafe and two gyms. We have 9,000 employees. Um, across the world right now, we have about 3,000 on that campus in Redlands. And last year, we did over a billion dollars in revenue for the first time. So pretty big company. We have zero debt. And like I said, 30% goes to research and development. And that little geography graphic in the bottom, that's my favorite spot on the campus. Um, it's on the entryway to the cafe right behind Starbucks. So I walk by it every time I'm there. And I just love to always remember that what we, everything we do comes back to geography. So GIS or those geographic information systems can be applied, I wouldn't even say in many fields, it's all the fields. Every single type of work that someone does in some respect can be touched 
by mapping, by data, by analytics. And so within our company, we have people split out by verticals and teams. So we have forestry and we have ocean and we have space, we have health, we have agriculture. Um, and then we have cross-sector teams that work across all of those things. I personally do projects with transportation companies and shipping companies and public safety because health does touch a lot of people. And as people are being more cognizant of how their environment affects their health and the social determinants of health that we're looking at much more since COVID. Um, those teams are bringing me in to help with their customers. And so that's something that I'm pretty excited about. So looking at the company is one thing, but I always like to talk about what people at Esri do every day because we all do different things. And I think that's what's most exciting about um, you know, for me, like walking into our cafe and eating lunch and being able to sit down with someone that used to work at NASA is pretty amazing. Um, and that happens all the time. In fact, you'll see a picture of her. Um, so what do people at Esri actually do? Uh, we inform world leaders. This is my, one of my favorite pictures because behind former Vice President Pence is my map. Uh, so I'm pretty excited about that one. I made that map. So this is the Johns Hopkins dashboard um, that plenty of you probably saw during COVID. Um, and this was what the U.S. government and actually every other single large government in the United States used. And it was started by a student, started by a student at Johns Hopkins. Um, when I first looked at this, this was January 22nd of 2020. And I took a screenshot. I'm kind of famous at Esri because I took this screenshot because in a live dashboard, once the day is done, it's gone. Um, but I saw this and I took the screenshot and I sent it to my boss or chief medical officer. And I said, Hey, I think we should start monitoring this thing a little bit more. This looks scary. And as you can see, there was only 17 deaths, and 555 people infected on that day. Um, and I'm the only person at Esri that has the screenshot. Um, midway, a couple months later, March 13th, we had 7,000 deaths, 78,000 recovered, and then 181,000 confirmed cases. And you can see that map, you know, looking at the red on the map, progressed really rapidly from January to March, as you know. Um, and just to look at two days ago, when I was doing the presentation, we're at six million, six and a half million deaths. I mean, it's pretty amazing. And I think this was a big story that we were able to tell using visualization. Um, I have a change over time um, live feed that shows how it progressed across the world really rapidly. And it's amazing to watch, sad, but amazing. Um, but aside from disease and sad things, we also make movies. We have people on our campus every day that work with Disney and other movie companies to create visual movies. Big Hero 6 was one that was completely done in our software. And you'd like to think to yourself, maybe how does a map have anything to do with that? So that particular cityscape that you're seeing was broken out in one of our um, products called City Engine, where they built out 83,000 separate buildings, 260,000 trees, all the different colors and shapes and sizes, layered them all in there, 250,000 streetlights. So all the different lights, all of it goes, it's really important to make that overall view. And it all comes together to make one, that's just one slide of an entire two hour movie. Um, that Disney team has won many awards from us because they do a lot of their films. And so next time you see a Disney movie, I challenge you to think of maybe where the map came in and how they made it. And if you play Fortnite or um, of course, Pokemon Go, the only time our systems almost crashed was Pokemon Go. Our company hates Pokemon Go because they, they did. They almost crashed us. But all of those are built on our system foundationally that we are the map that people use to run around town and figure out where the Pokemons are. Uh, we help manage emergencies. So during emergencies, you have, of course, your immediate um, response and then you have recovery after and we help with all aspects this is a look at the campfire every red dot there is a destroyed home uh green are ones that are safe and black are ones that were you know not so much and so we help inform people we help communities begin to recover we helped people understand when they could go back into their homes and looking at these aerial views you 
on the left, the green was what it used to look like. And then the right is what the community looked like after that campfire. Uh, we helped rescue people. The uh, Thai cave rescue that happened a few years ago, the entire operation to remove that soccer team from the cave was done using our 3D mapping. Um, the top right corner, you can see a look at that actual map that they used for that. We flew a team there. Um, those are the pictures down on the bottom left. And they worked with the divers and everyone else that was coordinating that um, rescue because there was no other way to get that 3D visualization under the mountains, under the ocean, and be able to get in there and rescue the kids. We help plan evacuations. And this is something that's really important. And I love this graphic. In Florida, when they have an evacuation because of a hurricane, they announce zones. Evacuate zone 18, 27, and people don't know what zone they live in. So we created an app called Know Your Zone, and they put it on the news on September 9th, the year that uh, Hurricane Irma came through, and they had 28 million people look and enter that map request to see where their zone was in one day. Um, definitely powerful when you start to look at those numbers, and we helped people figure out where they needed to evacuate to. Um, hurricane response is a big one. This is a map from Direct Relief, which is a nonprofit that places emergency supplies throughout the world when disaster is coming. So during, same thing, Irma and Maria, or no, this was Matthew, they went and placed these packets all over the affected areas that contained things like asthma inhalers and, you know, Tylenol and thermometers and all the things that people might need for recovery after disaster. And we help fight wars. And I say, but always on the good side, because we are a privately owned company and we can pick a side. Not all corporate en entities can say that. Um, we picked the side of Ukraine at the beginning of this war, and uh, we are actively involved in mapping um, the field there. I spent uh, one of the one of the notes that uh, Jessica had asked me was, you know, what I'm proud of about the work that I do. I spent a little over a week citing field hospitals and looking at the migratory patterns of people that were fleeing Ukraine and figuring out where services needed to be placed. The Red Cross comes to us and says, where are people going? You know, where do we set up field hospitals? Where do we set up refugees, camps and tents and all that sort of thing? If you don't know where the people are going and you put them in the wrong place, it's all for nothing. So it's something that um, we track. I work on field hospital locations for any sort of global um, occurrence that happens. And so that's something I've been really proud of. But like I said, we always get to pick a side. Um, and we map the deepest part of the ocean. The woman in that picture at the top is Dawn Wright. She's our chief scientist. And three weeks ago, she went down to the base of the Mariana Trench, the deepest part of the ocean, and started mapping that, which has never occurred before. Um, so we get to do pretty cool things, too, if we get involved enough in, in our company and in, with our customers. Um, but she is working on this project, and she came to us from NOAA, the Nat National App. Oceanic and Atmospheric Association. So another one of those brilliant people that chose to come to Esri and share their knowledge with us. And we help map and monitor the world satellites. So all satellites that are moving about in space are monitored and mapped out uh, by Esri because you cannot have them colliding. And they have to be very carefully coordinated where they are. And so that's something that they look at quite, quite deeply. Um, another project I really loved was working globally in disease surveillance and eradication of things such as polio. Um, polio is super contagious. You know, we've, well, we had it controlled in this country. It no longer is. We've had an outbreak in New York that they discovered through testing wastewater. Um, but in other countries, they've not been vaccinated. And so, Polio vaccine is a two-part vaccine. You need to be able to find the kids and then find them again a month later. And so for the first time, you know, these the global crews from the World Health Organization used to go out using paper and they would write everything down and try to make notes of where people were when they found them. And they give them that purple mark on their finger to indicate they've been vaccinated. And then they go back a month later and find the kids with purple fingers. Um, it sticks around for a couple months. For the first time, they used our mobile apps so that they could actually 
dot place a pin on the map exactly where they were when they found these very remote villages and then be able to go back to the exact same place and find those kids a month later. And they increased their vaccination rates by like 80 percent, um, really successful. And they were quite proud of that. We map vulnerable populations. And this is um, something that really came to the forefront during COVID because there's great discrepancies in how healthcare is delivered, especially in this country, but everywhere, um, and who has access. And so just saying, you know, we have an old graphic of the bicycle. And if you say we give out bike, you know, we, we give bikes to 10 people, so it was equitable, sure, that might make sense. But if one person is two feet tall and one person is 10 feet tall, the bikes don't fit the same and they can't all use them. And so we really look at health equity and making sure that um, things are delivered fairly and helping communities understand um, you know, how people are distributed in their areas and what are the things that are affecting those populations that might make them more apt to become sick or more apt to have an accident and really help the communities respond in that way um, as quickly and, and equitably as possible. And we help visualize data. So this is a look at HIV in the United States and the dark on those little bars standing up. If it gets darker, it means it's increasing. And if it's lighter, it means it was decreasing. And that's over a 10-year space-time analysis. I just love the graphics, the ability to look at something in 3D. If this was the, the live demo, you can actually pan back and forth across the country and take a look at everything um, in that really cool 3D mode. But we do a lot of that type of work. And we help people understand complicated problems. And this is a look at U.S. opioid deaths um, a few years back. Um, red indicates people dying. Yellow is smaller concentrations. The bigger the circles, the more people have died in that area. Um, and as you look at that, you, this data used to be in a spreadsheet. And so if you looked at a spreadsheet, you could not tell me where the worst part of America was. But when you look at this map, you know exactly where the worst place is for opioid deaths in this country. And if you look at this, this is opioid prescriptions per provider. And you can't really see the, the light, the, the tiny dots. Like California is mostly tiny dots. There's one larger dot up in Northern California. Um, this map was made for the federal government as they went out and started to break up what they call the pill mills, those doctors that were over prescribing opioids. And you can see, if you look at those red dots, those are one provider. That's one provider in that huge dot right above Atlanta that was prescribing probably 10,000 times more opioid prescriptions than any other provider. And if you look back, look where the deaths are. They're in the areas that those people were over prescribing. I mean, it definitely has a correlation. So just being able to visualize this, when they took those prescriptions and they put them on the map, they had a very easy time sending people out to make arrests. And there was a lot of arrests made from that particular study and that map. And then on the fun side, we help businesses. Um, we enable them for success. And so this is a look at pharmacies and where patients are driving, how far are they coming to go to a particular pharmacy? Why is that blue one pulling from so far away where the green one isn't? Maybe it's more of a rural area. Um, maybe they have got a higher concentration of um, people in, you know, that have their own cars as opposed to mass transportation. But when businesses are looking to expand, they want to know you know, where are we now and how successful are we? You don't want to cannibalize your other locations. So those three pharmacies are actually kind of close together. But if you look, they're not drawing from that middle area. That would be a cannibalization. They're actually pretty well situated. So we help them at SAS. Are we in the right location? Are we in the right location for now, for the people that we serve now? And then where are we going to place ourselves for three years, five years, 10 years from now? Um, if I have a hospital opening a diabetes clinic. They want to make sure they're serving people that have diabetes now, but we can help them predict where people are going to have diabetes in the future, which is a little bit scary if you think about it, but there's fundamental parameters that go into that. Where do we have 
a lack of fresh and healthy food? Where do they have no grocery stores? It's all fast food. It's what we call a food swamp. Um, where do we have a lack of medical providers and people that can't get to healthcare? So we take all those things into effect and we help them do predictive analysis for the future. And we help run cities every day. All the big cities, all the small cities in this country are using us. And this is a look. Uh, let's see. The left side is the Palm Desert zoning map. Um, so they put that one together. Odd choice of colors. It's very pastel. I'm a little bit of a map snob. I don't love that one. Um, City of Palm Springs mapped out their free electric vehicle charging stations on the right. And then the bottom was actually the whole Coachella Valley. And it was traffic counts. And so you can look in that map and it's interactive and if you click on any of those red dots it'll give you the traffic counts at any of those intersections and i think it also gives like accident counts and pedestrian traffic so it's a way to really go in and analyze what the traffic looks like around the valley and so we those are some examples of what we do i, I hope they were interesting um our gis is our main product and everything's built off of that uh, we're constantly advancing. So we take that location intelligence. It's not just where you are on the map, but understanding what's around it, um, using that within the system, and then bringing in things like spatial analysis and real-time data and community engagement and artificial intelligence and big data. We've got a lot of new things coming up, working with the newest technologies. Um, so we are constantly growing and improving and using that 30% they reinvest back into the company. Um, but we put our users first, always. Um, we're a unique company in that I'm, I'm in sales. I'm on the sales force, but we don't make commissions. Nobody in our company is paid a commission for selling anything because our founder always wants us to make the right choice for our customers based on what's going to be good for them and not necessarily what's going to benefit us financially. When I go to the owner of my company and I talk about something I'm putting together for a customer, he never asks me how much it's going to cost them. If I'm excited because it's a big project and I tell them that, he says, yeah, but how is it going to help change the world? And he truly means that. How is it going to make a difference? Um, a lot of companies kind of talk the talk, but we really do walk that walk. Um, they really do take that forward. And as part of that, we have a huge professional development program within Esri. So we have our own Esri Press. We publish our own books. I went to school for journalism and never thought ever that I would be a published author for anything. And I'm now a published author in two different books because I helped write them at Esri. Um, when you come up with an idea, Esri is the kind of company that basically tells you, you now own that idea and go do it, um, which is kind of scary, but also really beneficial. Um, but they do really, really, truly believe in lifelong learning. And we do have, um, of course, expense reimbursement for further education and lots and lots of people on scholarships within our organization that are going for their master's degrees and their PhDs. And um, even at University of Redlands, we have the Jack Dangerman Scholarship. So if you're looking to study GIS, you could potentially go to our University of Redlands for free. Um, we're deeply involved at that school just because it's so close to our campus. And we always put an emphasis on empowering positive change. We give out, uh, we call education licenses to any K through 12 school in the world for free. So years ago, I think it was five or six years ago, they made the billion dollar pledge to give away our software to any K through 12 school. Um, so we do that still. Universities get greatly discounted rates um, for utilizing our software. And we're constantly giving back uh, through social um, network, community health and human rights programs, conservation, the pictures of Jane Goodall, uh, who's the woman that researched the gorillas. And she comes every year and speaks to the staff because she loves Esri so much. And we, we were an integral part of her work. Mm -hmm. And what sets us apart? I think there, like I said, there are a lot of uh, software companies out there, but I think we're truly different. And one of the things I'm most proud of is our disaster response program, which is anywhere in the world, anything happens that's bad, any type of disaster, all people have to do is call us and we will help. So we will give you software for free. We will give you people to help 
build something such as I had a hospital, a New Orleans Children's Hospital is not a customer of ours. And they called during COVID and said, we're having a large storm and had to evacuate people. Plus half our staff has COVID and they can't come to work and we can't balance those things. We can't figure out who can come to work and we can't figure out where to evacuate people. So we worked overnight. The disaster response team set them up evacuation routes and plans. No problem. That was done. And then we did a survey tool for them so they could survey their staff, figure out who could come to work and locate where they those people were. So perhaps they could get to where people had been evacuated. So we do that at no cost um, for anything anywhere in the world, which is pretty amazing. And I'm proud to be part of that team um, and lend my insight into how we're going to help. Um, but it's one of the things I like the most about Esri. Um, a few other things that I didn't put in the slide, but you know, we have incredible benefits and it's something younger kids don't think about so much, but we have free health care, completely free for ourselves and our entire, you know, our family, our children, our husbands, whatever, completely free. Uh, we have a profit sharing program where a percentage of my salary goes back into my 401k every year as an added bonus. We have sports teams, we have social things, we have all kinds of things um, that we get to do. And of course, that lifelong learning really is um, something that we strive for. I'm required to take a certain number of classes every year, just so that we can all prove that we're still learning and growing and being the best we can for our customers. So that was my presentation. I hope that it was of interest to you. Um, learn a little bit more about this big company in a little town not too far from us and i will stop sharing so i can see you again wow thank you very much i mean you are right it's everywhere around us and i'm pretty sure i use some of the maps even without knowing it's from you definitely i was checking the coronavirus map mm -hmm. as it was going and i i did use the pokemon go and i remember so i kind of got me interested and we have like, if everyone has any questions, like, please, like, come in. I'm kind of interested in the emergency response. Like, how does it work? Like, you have a team that is specifically just for the emergency response. And then something happens, you get them, and then you send them. Or how do they start collecting the data? Sure. So for our disaster response program, we have a number of people within Esri um, they'd either have that fundamental knowledge. So like I came from emergency management. So I raised my hand and said, hey, I'll help. I'm in health, but I'll help on that team. And we have probably 50 people across Esri that have volunteered to do that. We have two two or three full-time people that manage that program. Then we have a whole bunch of people that work in the building with no windows, um, which is where they manage uh, oh, all of U.S. federal government uses us. So the Department of Defense and the CIA and the FBI and all the acronym agencies use us. And so a lot of them are involved because war, you know, we're helping the countries with war response. Um, so when something happens, you can Google Esri Disaster Response Program, and there's a form to fill out. And so you just fill out the form that says, I'm, you know, we got one from the Red Cross in Poland. We're in Poland. We don't know where to put refugee camps and field hospitals. Can you please help us? And so we take that. It goes to the people that manage the program. They called me at eight o'clock at night and said, can you help figure out where people are migrating from out of Ukraine? Um, we get that data. That comes from a number of different providers. Um, there's a company we work with in Finland that does human migration patterns. This is, this is to me, is one of the most interesting things. They monitor cell phone data. So they don't look at your personal data, but what they see is where your cell phone sleeps at night. So they know when your cell phone is in one place for eight hours, that's where you live. That's where you sleep. And if it's there for three years, you definitely live there permanently. If all of a sudden you go away for a week or two weeks and you come back, they know you still live in that location. But then when you've been there a long time and then you move and you stay in the next place for a long time, you've migrated and they capture that data and they furnish that data out to people who use that. I used it quite a bit this past couple of years because, for instance, in San Francisco, all the young tech workers left because they could, because they didn't have to live there anymore and go to work. It's a very expensive place. They didn't want to live there. So my hospitals that serve the people of San Francisco 
said, we've lost 500,000 people. They lost 550,000 people in one year out of San Francisco as permanent residents. How do we adapt to the people that are going to move into their place instead of them? So if they lost young tech workers and most of the hospital services were geared towards them, but they have young families move in. How do we reassess and reevaluate our services that we offer to then meet the needs of the new people? So that's what we did in Ukraine was looking at where are the arteries that people are moving out from. So there was bus lines, there was walkers, there was the trains, and then there was airplanes. And so we're able to figure out where people were going to go and set up those hospitals as close to the border as possible in an area that could serve those people and hopefully like disseminate them out to other communities. But that's how our disaster response team works. And hurricanes, I mean, with um, the one going on right now, Flora, I can't remember the name. Mm -hmm. Same thing, people working overnight for days. Um, even, you know, our current customers, the cities and the towns, I handled for a long time Harris County, Texas, which is the city of Houston and the county around it. Every time they have a hurricane, it's a nightmare there. Everything floods, people die, it's terrible. Baseline health problem after a flood is you have to boil your water. So they would have to figure out where all the areas were flooded so they could issue boil water orders. And we just routinely do that for them because they just don't have the bandwidth and the people to help. So, um, you know, even with our 50 people base and the disaster response program, we can bring in anybody from within Esri to help us as well. Oh, wow. I kind of wanted to ask, like, if you seen any map that you are not supposed to see and so many information goes through it also I have oh. <laughs> I have so we don't share those maps in our yeah. presentations we're pretty careful in fact when I did the Ukraine maps and put them in this presentation I made sure I just searched publicly available maps because oh. I wanted to make sure I didn't use anything that I may have had that I shouldn't share <laughs> no thank you so I do want to ask like, what if you're like a small organization like non-profit or even college or you have like some cool parasitical and you want to use this software. So it's also available to everyone, right? Even like individual who wants to maybe play with a man. So the least expensive way that you can use our software is what we call a personal use license. You just Google Esri personal use license. It's $100 a year. Anyone can get that. And it includes an amazing amount of the extensions and the added things that come on top of the base mapping license. So yep, Esri personal use license. You're not supposed to use it to do corporate work. You're not supposed to use it to do large scale research and those sorts of things. Um, I gifted it to my dad one year for Christmas and he used it to figure out where the members of his golf club lived and where he wasn't reaching new members for his golf club and how he could go out and talk to those people and do a marketing campaign to get more golfers. I mean, that's what it's meant for. We also have a new program called Story Maps. It's not new, but Story Maps are Google Esri Story Maps Gallery. It's I'll send you a follow-up email, Jessica, and you can send it out to people too. But Story Maps are a way to tell a story using maps because a lot of people don't understand maps they want the verbiage next to it explaining what it is um my mom for instance can't look at a map and understand anything where i get really frustrated because i'm like that tells you exactly what you need to know but she wants the words she wants the explanation so a story map runs the verbiage alongside maps that you can interact with you can turn layers on and off you can tell stories and we used to have that as part of our corporate offering in the last year they released story maps for free so now personally you can use esri story maps i think your first year is free and then after that it might be a hundred dollars a year um we have people doing travel blogs using this people and that's really that was the biggest use my favorite one was uh two brothers that took their dad who was turning 70 on the great tuk tuk race in india and they went across the country in a tuk tuk and they documented everything and within the story map you can have maps and videos and you know all sorts of things so it was really, really fun well it sounds very creative to me actually it's what it depends on you people say data is boring but right. it's about what you do with the data so absolutely that's a thing so um, what if you want to work at Azri? Because it's pretty amazing what you said. There is like from data, like the, the girl who went to, down to the bar in the trench. 
and also like to employ like an army of people who do like drone mapping and operate drones. So, we do. We that? have we have an entire program that does drones. Uh, we have a um, a whole visual. I don't deal with imagery so much. So imagery like the the graphic behind you of the globe, you know, with the the sun setting. We have an entire group of people that deals with imagery. Hospitals don't use it as much, but it's fascinating because imagery applies to, you know, that captured data from up in the sky and down in the sea and everywhere in between. And then how do you take, we have a, we have a product called drone to map. So I can take a drone. I've done this in Texas and fly it over a neighborhood and it captures the photos of all the houses. And then we feed into our artificial intelligence platform, we feed into our system a picture of a good house. So little, you know, picket fence with nothing broken, windows, nothing broken, pool is a certain color, it's not green, it's not empty, um, no trash in the arts, a clean house. We feed in the pictures of the clean house, we feed in the pictures of the bad, the broken down, the abandoned, what they call urban blight. We feed in the bad pictures, the artificial intelligence system takes every single photo of every single property in Houston and spits back out a list to the city of the ones they might want to go visit to mm -hmm. issue citations or to clean up or to offer assistance. That would take thousands of man hours for people to drive up and down the street and figure that out. So it's just one of the one of the uses that I've been excited about drones. Oh yeah. I mean, is there any problem with the privacy that people input data that they shouldn't like is there any problem with that so far no <laughs> uh, you know they're using it they when you look at um the i can't remember the name of the program but they have a you know permits and licensing and they really just want their community to be kept up and so they're not necessarily going out and they're offering assistance, put it that way. They're not just issuing citations, they're offering assistance, but they're really going off that broken window theory where once you have a broken window, the rest of the community will, will fall down around it if you don't fix it. And so they're really trying to um, stay on top of those things. Pools, green pools in Houston are a terrible problem because that's where the mosquitoes come from. So they absolutely monitor with zones, with uh, drones, those pools and they separate them into zones and they can go across and see those dark green pools and immediately go out there and you can be living in the home and they will jump your wall to go and treat that pool and they have every right to do that because it's a public health emergency oh wow okay thank you if anyone likes the visual map i think i do because i guess it's my kind of like the marketing background but when you go to esri's website and also on their instagram they have like a lot of amazing maps that you can discover and it's, it's pretty visual, so it's up to you what you do with a map, right? So I guess it helps to have someone who, like a graphic designer or a storyteller, basically, because it's data who can work with all of these maps. So, like, definitely go check out their website. Also, like, check out the Instagram, because it's, it's very playful when you think about mm -hmm. it. And so does everyone, anyone else have any questions you would like to ask? Because it's a lot of information. <laughs> I have a question. So, um, Kimberly, with the um, healthcare at such stake today, uh, is uh, are we in any kind of programs where we are monitoring uh, closing gaps with systems in healthcare? Yeah, absolutely. So the CDC actually just instituted a social determinants of health study, and they're using um, our system to not only study that, but to make it available for people. I've done presentations. I work a lot in, in health equity. Um, I do a lot of presentations where I, I can show you, and I have one example in Chicago, you know, people use public transit, they use the train. Between two train stations, your life expectancy goes down nine years. If you live by this station, you're going to live nine years longer for the most part than by this station. And so for the city of Chicago to be able to know that and be able to go in and start to address those issues on a fundamental level for their people in their community, you know, that's the baseline for everything in our communities. And it's something where, you know, I work a lot with commercial health now and they used to just say, we want to get people in the hospital because that's how we got paid. 
but it's changing to what we call value-based care. And now they know, in a lot of cases, they make their money by addressing the health of the community and having them not come into the hospital. They want them to be more healthy. And so, um, and they're working with public health and with government and with education to help drive that from the baseline right up until people walk in the door. So, you know, we're seeing really good changes. Um, COVID, you know, as many things that were bad about it, one of the good things was it really brought this to the forefront. Um, and there are some amazing stories that came out of that. But it's just nice to see that we've got corporate America working with the government now much more closely than they ever have before. I'm sure because the expenses are so much, even when you look at health care and also going into a hospital and spending that kind of money, mm -hmm. if you can, your recovery at home is going to be better and have the different providers come into your home. That's another model that John Hopkins is starting to work on, right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. And they use us to, you know, track those providers when they're out in the field, because when you route them, you want to put them on the most conducive route to success. So for the most part, if you plan, if you just give people a list of places to go in a day, it's amazing if you look at where they actually drive and their traffic patterns. They don't think it through. They just go from here to here. But if you plan it and you have optimized routing, which is something we do, uh, one of the projects we did years ago, not my team, but for UPS, UPS came to Esri six years ago and said, we're spending, I mean, unbelievable amounts of money. And we keep you know, on gas. And we keep getting in accidents. We're getting in accidents all the time. It costs them millions and millions of dollars. And so Esri took eight months and basically rerouted every UPS driver in the country so that they only make right turns because they get in accidents when they turn left and they cross over oncoming traffic. But when they turn right, they're not crossing over any traffic. So they rerouted every single UPS truck that year. They saved $800 million the first year. And now they use that across all the world. And you know what happens after UPS does it, then FedEx did it too. <laughs> yes, of course, of course. The little things make a big difference, you know? Yeah. Yes. So anyone else has any questions? Yeah, I actually, I have a question. Um, first of all, it's, I think it's super cool how much information you guys are able to gather. Um, and this might be a hard question, but one of the first things that came to mind for me was, um, what would you say to the people that might be, I guess, scared of how much data you're able to pull mm -hmm. or, um, yeah, I, I think. I think one thing to always address, it, it's interesting. I think it's something people try not to think about a whole lot because when you do think about it, it is scary. Absolutely. How much data is out there about all of us. And I see the results of the data. I see the data that I have my hands on, but yet I use the internet and I shop online and I do all the same things. And I tend to, you know, not want to think about it. I will say that most of the data that's coming through is relatively scrubbed. I'm unique because I deal with um, medical data. So HIPAA protects you as a consumer from your provider of healthcare from sharing your information with anybody. And we are so locked down in our system. We don't touch that. Um, the hospitals have to have certain systems from us that are on premise, on their own premise. They're not in our shared server environments. So we have to do a lot of extra work to make sure that that data is locked down. Um, in the same respect, like the U.S. data, the Department of Defense, the, the entities within our company that are seeing things that no one else should, um, like I can't even get into that building. Um, but for the most part, you've got commercially available data. So everything you do, there is a company gathering that information. Maybe not necessarily about you, Emma, but you, female, 22 years old, whatever it may be, living in this area that likes to shop online and buy these certain things at this time of day, they know everything, everything. And so I always just try to measure it with, does that bother me? How much does it bother me? How much will it come into play? I don't like it when I talk about something with somebody and then Facebook shows me an ad for it. That creeps me out really bad. And it happens all the time. But other than that, 
Um, like I said, I see the data, it's generalized, it's scrubbed. But, you know, I just did a study for the Heart Association, American Heart Association in Dallas. And they said, you know, we want to get more women to come to our heart walk. And the only women that come to the heart walk are people that have had heart attacks and are over 50. And we want to get younger women. And so we were able to pull variables out of our system for them that we buy this data from somewhere else. And we were able to say, these are women between 25 and 35 that exercise every day, that have posted on social media in the last week, that, um, you know, shop at Lululemon and that drink coffee at Starbucks. So it's not going to give them that it was you, Emma, that did that, but it's going to give them these people live in this area so that when they go and direct their marketing to try to get those women to come to the heart walk, they increase like 65% the amount of women because they, they help them target their marketing. So we always, 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 and this was, I think it was Google's, you know, little tagline, don't be evil. Uh, we always hope people are using our information for good. I would say 99% of the time what I come across, they're using it for good. Then again, I'm in health. And so it's almost always for good. Um, but yeah, I hope I answered that in some way. I agree. It's it's freaky. It's scary. But it's also, I think, just part of day-to-day -day life now in technology. Yes. Yes. Definitely. Yeah, no, that's very true. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Thank you. The difference is how you use it. You use it for something bad. Yeah. But if you can actually use this data to make the society better, like that's amazing. Right. So, yes. Yeah. Thank you. So does anyone else have any questions? Or, oh, sorry. I have a question. Uh, you yeah. Right here. Okay. Yeah. Um, thank you so much. It's a good presentation. Um, I just really want to understand because what I hear is that you don't have standard, that there is no standardization in what you do. And also, they're saying that there is no integration based on sometimes you find that each city has different GIS uh, system mm -hmm. or different areas. You cannot integrate them. Also, sometimes talking about that really there is no, there is inconsistency in your data. So I just want to know about that. Sure. So standards, I would say the cities are welcome to work together. They can certainly do that in the Coachella Valley. Most choose not to for some things. I will say that for political redistricting, they did work together. Um, but for the most part, within our system, within our customer base, they're purchasing the software to use how they care to use it. Um, and some are on an individual level locally. Some, I have some customers that use it globally. Um, and they've got the same base map. So yes, they when you dial into the system, it's going to show you that map that you're supposed to use that has their colors and their logo on it. And that has been standardized throughout the organization. Um, but other than that, it is a very individual. I mean, that's one of the hallmarks of our system is that you can be very creative with things like the look and feel of the map. The street network is embedded. The maps themselves are done by our cartography team, which is over 200 people. Um, all data is vetted by our demographers, so over three or 400 people. There's quite a lot. So all of that, in fact, even for my data catalog, I have a data catalog. So for every data point that we offer to people, we have um, a data catalog that shows you exactly where that came from. So which survey, which study, which company, so that all of it can be proven out and utilized um, for truth. Like it always is the system of record. What do you say about the pricing? Because many third world countries, they say, although Esri is a good company that really say they help those vulnerable people in countries, but they say that they are still far behind because of your pricing. Is there any way that you're looking into the pricing maybe as a company to put it down so that other uh, countries or communities that really don't have much money could afford it? Right. I wish I could answer that, but I only work in the U.S. I handle 
only US based companies. I've never done any business globally. We have a completely different, I will tell you two things. Anything outside the US is a business partnership. So the owner of our company owns a portion of that. And then also the other half is a distributorship. So in Nigeria, it's Esri Nigeria. It is owned by someone in Nigeria. And then our owner of our company owns a portion of that. And I have a couple of friends that have moved to Esri, out to Nigeria to work with Esri Nigeria. Um, so they base their pricing on what they feel is conducive to the market where they are. And I can tell you that globally, like the pricing in the UK is different than it is in Spain because you do have those distributorships that are influencing the price. In the US, it's standardized across the United States. Um, and we only have one price book and the lowest price point that we could go to is, is GSA, so the government service contract pricing. But it is, I think, definitely more in flux across the world. But I unfortunately don't do business outside of the US, so I can't say that um, I have any control of that part. Thank you. Yeah, but distributorships, that makes a big difference because I it's it it's the same company in some respects, but also very different. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow, well, thank, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> just, yeah. Yeah, I do believe we learned a really a lot today. Like a lot of things I even have no idea how to work and or what do I use for. So I was like, really thank you very much for being here with us. It was like really amazing opportunity and thank you for also showing us all the data and sharing some secrets with us. <laughs> <laughs> so hopefully. And uh, I also have to do a plug-in for our next cafe. It's like also on the Wednesday at 7 or 6 to 7. And we will be talking about economic development, especially with Lauren Brueggemann. She's the director of a sustainability and uh, community engagement in the greater Palm Springs. Of course, we'll be talking about sustainability and economic development in Palm Springs, also like in the culture. So if you if you wish to join us, like you are welcome. Uh, I think they would also be very happy to use your data. So I can I can feel tempted to get it for myself and maybe play with it. So I hope everyone else feels the same too. Please do. <laughs> Thank you very much for being here with us and sharing all the information with us. Yes. Excellent. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Thank. <laughs>